Hi, welcome everybody. Welcome to uh, and Happy New Year. Welcome to the first Transit Coalition dinner meeting of the year. It's good to start off with a full group of folks to learn about an exciting project, which is the Valley to West Los Angeles Rail Corridor. Um, I'm Bart Reed, the Executive Director of the Transit Coalition. We're a nonprofit dealing with transportation advocacy, land use planning, goods movement, and educational programs. This is our first educational program of the year. Next month, we're going to have, as our speaker, the CEO of Metrolink. Then the month after that, we're going to do uh, Derek Benedict with LA Streetcar. Derek is here, why don't you say hi there? And in addition to that, we have private public partnerships with the Metro team. And then we have something to do with uh, the extension of the purple line towards uh, Santa Monica. So we've got educational programs. We're always looking for sponsorships. I should mention Paul Dyson from RailPack is there are RailPack newsletters over here. He's unfortunately out sick, and then most of his team is actually out sick, unfortunately. But RailPack is a longtime sponsor of Transit Coalition. In addition to that, we've got uh, Destination Enterprises, and Marcy couldn't be here tonight but she wants to say Happy New Year to everybody. So welcome. So we're gonna go around the room real quickly and do introductions and just really brief. And then Corey will know who you are and he'll give you a little biography and stuff. So let's start with... Um, so I'm Jaime Bueno with Group Delta. Consultant. Welcome Jaime. Melissa Masali, Group Delta as well. Eric Wickland, uh, Urban Energy Systems, LLC, and the CEO of the American Monorail Company. Um, begin to fit in with ITERIC. Joel Falco, KOA. Tom Jenkins with HNTV. I'm Heidi Sammy with HNTV. Steve Green with HNTV. <laughs> Elena Salcido with HNTV. <laughs> Debbie Roberts with XTV. Lucy Tara Lewis with HDR. Zach McDonough with HDR. Nick Velasquez, Moffat Nickel. Tom Zeller, Moffat Nickel. Grace Lou Lugro. Mark Peabody, Klein Felder. Isaac Segovia, Warner. Carl Warner, Warner. Tom <laughs> Peabody, FPO. Amy Jones with the Alliance Group. Ali Adam, Mark McDonald. Dan Templis, Mark McDonald. Derek Reddick, ESP, and Tony Streetcar. Uh, Nathan Mock, WSP. Jason Ackerman, Van Nuys Neighborhood Council. Uh, Will Wong, Clowner Group. Greg Kyle, Kimberly Warren. Kimberly Yu, Ariana and Associates. Al Dash, Sherrill Associates. Tom Stone with the um, LA Sky Rail Express team. Honey of Burma, AV. Martha Valenzuela with Modern Times. Sorry, with Terry Zanagiagi. Justin Wilson with HOK. Albert Ken Sherrill, HOK. Andy Allison, Federal as well. Gordon Hope. Daniel Miller, retiree from uh, LA Metro Management. Peter Carter, Metro. Will Baker, Transit Advocate. Ana Carrion, Community Coalition, South Los Angeles. Dan Gaines, consultant, uh, currently LA Times. Rich Felton, who retired last week. Well, I want to welcome you again to our meeting. And I will mention that we are always open to sponsorships. Um, we have lots of programs, like Metro is revamping the bus system. The parts they tell you about, the good parts, they're gonna give a lot more service on certain streets, but they don't tell you the details, like streets that we fought for years, like uh, Glen Oaks and Silmar, that connects to the hospital and connects to the community. They're taking route segments away by miles. I mean, different parts of the city. And so there needs to be a replacement. They take a one seat right away that would be useful to get to Mission College because there's the politics of giving LADOT some miles. And it doesn't help the riders get on the bus somewhere in the South Valley to go straight to Mission College. So we do our advocacy work, but we use sponsorship money to help fund those kinds of programs. So uh, as 
would appreciate it if anybody wants to step forward and sponsor let me know or send me a text message and we'd be help we'd be appreciative. Um, Corey is going to tell you a little about himself because I'm cheating and didn't read the, the bio. But I've, known, <laughs> <laughs> I, but I've known Corey for a very long time. Years ago, there was an uh, idea that you take the Crenshaw line and put an electric bus with some sort of pole in the street and the <coughs> would be a wonderful thing. And the guy that was promoting it had the ear of the county supervisor who was amazingly influenced by the wonders of an electric powered bus. Um, we came to a number of community meetings and said the community deserves electric light rail. And amazingly enough, electric light rail Crenshaw is opening in about a year, I guess. So it's there. It's amazing that the city is being belted with railroads, with future railroads. And um, Derek, in two months, will tell you about the streetcars. And he doesn't just want one streetcar. He's got the idea that we can fill in the gaps with more streetcar lines, and I think that's an elegant and wonderful idea. So with that, Corey, tell a little about your Sure. Story. And thank you, Bart, and good evening, everyone. <laughs> so let me, uh, I know many of you are here, so I'll, uh, I'll keep the bio brief, but I work for LA Metro, obviously. I'm the Deputy Executive Officer with our Planning Department. Um, had the pleasure and fortune to work on a number of projects over the years here for Metro to develop them. Our team basically develops the project from concept through the environmental clearance, and then we hand it off to our construction unit here at Metro to uh, hopefully build it and open it for operation. So, uh, Sepulveda is one of the project that, projects that my team works on. Uh, we have a number of other ones, but uh, you're here tonight for this one, so I'll stay focused on that. Um, I do want to point out uh, Peter Carter, though. He, he's one of the folks that were uh, introduced earlier. Peter has been a uh, uh, important part of my team thus far and will continue to be as we take this project forward. So um, I'm fortunate to have a really good team surrounding me and that's why uh, we're here today with some advancements in the project. So um, I'll get into the presentation itself. We have a little over an hour to get through this and uh, I'm sure there's gonna be some questions afterwards so we'll field that. Before I get started though, I have to make a couple announcements. One is that we do have a couple of procurements that are underway. Some of you probably know about them. Uh, one of them has to do with our environmental clearance process. That RFP has been released. Uh, another one has to do with what we call a pre-development agreement. So that's a, a precursor to a possible P3 arrangement here at Metro. That is also a procurement that's on the streets. So those two procurements do prohibit me from uh, talking a lot about the, the details of those specific uh, procurements, so I do have to apologize in advance. If you have any questions on that, I can't answer them, so if you'd uh, hold them back, I'd appreciate it. Um, if, you, if you try to trick me, I'll just tell you no, so that's, that's how it works tonight. But uh, with that, uh, let's get into the presentation itself. So what I'm gonna cover tonight is a recap of the recently completed feasibility study that we did for the project. Um, we call it a feasibility study, many people call it an alternatives analysis study, uh, a lot of different names, but essentially the same goal here, which was to start with a lot of alternatives and eventually narrow them down to a smaller set that we would consider taking into the environmental process. So um, some of you may know that this project is one of the Measure M countywide sales tax projects that we have uh, going forward. Uh, this one uh, is identified in the Measure M uh, sales tax as broken down into three different parts. Okay, uh, the first part, which we call uh, segment one, or, is related to the express lanes. So although it's called the Sepulveda Transit Corridor, it's specifically supposed to implement the express lanes between the 101 and the 10. The next two segments of the project have to do with transit, and that's what we studied as part of this feasibility study. Uh, and the transit uh, projects are broken down into two phases. The first one has to do with uh, implementing transit between the west side and the San Fernando Valley. And the second phase has to do with West Side LEX. So for this feasibility study, we, we looked at both phases to understand how they might work together uh, in the long term. And we were focused primarily on high capacity rail or other high capacity uh, transit options that could move the large amount of people we expected to utilize this corridor. Uh, we wanted to focus on connections to the existing and planned transit network. As you can see, we're starting to build out our, our network quite extensively throughout this area. But there is a noticeable, noticeable gap between some of our east-west lines and what we can do north-south to connect them. Um, so alignment, station locations are some of the things we looked at. We understand that maintenance facility uh, requirements will, will be something we, we wanted to look into. Often siding maintenance facilities can be very challenging for our project, so we wanted to get an early look at what that might include. Um, and 
And so I'll talk through the development of these two corridor sections uh, throughout the presentation. So in terms of the purpose and need, we typically explain why we're doing the project, why, why is there a need for transit, what might it do to address uh, the travel markets out there today. Uh, I don't think I need to explain to this group why we might want to introduce transit in this corridor. Um, but I will say that this corridor did offer an opportunity that not many metro projects has, and that's the ability to actually compete with a private automobile. Um, given that many folks have to rely on the 405 freeway, it can be very congested, very slow at times. Having some type of high speed, high capacity transit line that connects the west side and the valley uh, could compete very well against uh, slow traffic through the past. So as we, be, as we set out with the project, we wanted to look at uh, what's out there today. So typically we just start by researching existing conditions, what transit's out there, what are we planning, understanding uh, projects that are in the pipeline, both at Metro and, and at other, uh, other agencies. And as you can see here, we have a number of things going on throughout the county that Metro is directly in control of. So we have a number of projects in the valley that are in development. Uh, we have the East San Fernando Valley Light Rail Line, which I'll talk about in more detail in a moment, but that's a new light rail service being planned between the Orange Line on the south end all the way up to the Silmar San Fernando Valley Metrolink Station in the north end, primarily running along Van Nuys Boulevard. So <clears throat> that's a new light rail line. We're looking at improvements to the Metro Orange Line, which is an existing BRT line, uh, specifically grade separations uh, elevated uh, viaducts at, at Van Nuys and at Sepulveda. So important considerations for us as we look at some of the options. I mentioned the express lanes. They're being planned for the, between the 10 and the 101 through Sepulveda Pass. We have the Purple Line extension on the west side. We have the already completed Expo Line on the west side. <clears throat> and then down in the LAX area, we have the Crenshaw Line, which is under construction. And then we have the Airport People Mover, which will eventually connect to the Crenshaw Line at the future Airport Metro Connector Station. So again, quite a bit going on. A lot of it's east-west. So this project offers an opportunity to provide a north-south spine, high capacity spine, to connect to a lot of these, these, other, these other lines in our, in our region. So our study area, as you might uh, expect, there are a lot of trips in our study area, uh, both within the study area and, and coming into and out of the study area. Um, millions of trips on a daily basis, um, severe traffic congestion is not new to anyone here. Uh, obviously travel times can be variable given the congestion. Uh, it's hard to determine how long it's going to take you to get from one side of the uh, Sepulveda Pass to the other, given the congestion. We're looking at over 400,000 trips a day going through the Sepulveda Pass, but only 2% of those trips are actually using transit. So again, opportunity here to um, increase the mode share for transit uh, throughout this corridor. When we started out the project, we, we started with looking at some of the travel patterns that we were expecting to see throughout the entire study area. And, and what we did is we took cell phone data to understand uh, trip origins and destinations, and we put them on a map to see if we could visualize where folks are moving uh, to and from. And what we are showing here first is the travel patterns we're looking at between the valley and the west side. And the black line you see here on the map going um, uh, right to left is what we call a screen line. But basically, all these small dots you see at some point pass through that black line going through the Sepulveda Pass. And what we want to see is where, pe where are people moving and where are they going to. And what we see here is that between the valley and west side, um, trips are, are generally dispersed quite a bit, uh, especially in the valley. Uh, trips either start or end in a number of locations throughout the valley. The valley is very large. It's a, it's a very large area <coughs> with a lot of housing, so it's understandable that trips could be so dispersed. Um, we do see a slight concentration of activity, though, east of the 405 and near Van Boulevard. Uh, north of the 101. And then on the west side, our concentration is kind of where we expect it, right? Between Century City and Santa Monica, north of the 10. Um, a lot of trips are either starting or ending in that location. And again, it's kind of a, uh, a look at where the houses are in the valley versus where there are job centers on the west side. Uh, now, between the valley and LAX, trips begin to go down a little bit. People aren't quite making that longer trip but we do see a little bit of uh, activity clustering around LAX, as might be expected given uh, the draw of LAX. We also look at this from the west side to LAX perspective. Um, we drew a black line there near the 90 or Bayonne Creek, and we were looking at trips that went through that black line, um, and the concentration of activity is, is really more focused around the west side and LAX area. Again, between Century City and Santa Monica, north of the 10, we had another 
bit of activity east of the 405, and then obviously around the 405, as we might expect. So given this information and our look at you know, how we might connect to the other existing and planned lines in our area, we came out during our study uh, for the first time and introduced six concepts to the public, and they're shown here. And I won't go into much detail because they changed quite a bit uh, as, as we went along through the study, but uh, initially we set out with uh, six total concepts. Two of them were uh, heavy rail transit concepts, which we call HRT, which are essentially the same thing as our purple line and subway lines today, or purple and red line subways today. We also had two light rail transit concepts, LRT. Uh, these primarily looked at extending that East San Fernando Valley light rail line that I mentioned earlier, extending it south to the west side. Uh, and then we had one monorail uh, concept, number five there. And then we also looked at possibly extending the purple line north into the valley. So uh, after introducing those concepts and getting initial feedback from folks about what they liked, disliked, or other thoughts, um, we began looking at, looking at them in more detail. And one of the interesting findings that we came across early on was an issue with uh, capacity on uh, one of the other lines that connect to the Sepulveda project. Um, so interesting in, in the sense that we were looking at the effects Sepulveda would, Sepulveda would have on other projects in the area. And what we're showing here is one of those light rail concepts, which again is, is proposing to extend the East San Fernando Valley light rail corridor south to the west side. And what we found is that the, um, the passenger loads that might uh, occur on the East San, Fernando, East San Fernando Valley line would actually exceed that line's capacity. Uh, and the reason for that is that folks are actually using East San Fernando Valley line to enter into the Sepulveda corridor, right, to get to the west side, understandable. So what you show, see here on the map are a couple of different lines. So the red dashed line shows what the light rail line, the East San Fernando Valley light rail line, could accommodate in terms of passenger loads uh, in the morning going southbound in the peak hour, the busiest hour of the day. The pink line we show there are the loads that might be on that line in the morning if the San Fernando Valley were operating on its own. The Sepulveda project did not exist. Uh, the blue line, however, then takes into account Sepulveda. So when you introduce the Sepulveda project, when you extend the San Fernando Valley all the way to the west side, what happens is, is that the ridership or the load, passenger load on that line goes up significantly. Now if you see this other dash red line here at the top, what that is showing is, is our attempt to anticipate this demand, okay? So what we had actually um, proposed as part of this concept was to both operate a light rail line from Silmar all the way down to Expo uh, at five minute frequency during the peak period, and also operate a second line between the orange line and Expo at five minute frequency. Um, therefore, we would operate every two and a half minute trains between orange line and Expo. The idea being, since the light rail system is generally smaller, we would, accom we would accommodate more people by operating trains more frequently. Um, so that's where we had the additional capacity south of the orange line. Unfortunately, that passenger demand and that passenger load um, exceeded our capacity before it got to the orange line and had, had an opportunity to take advantage of this additional capacity. So this was occurring with the concept three, one of the light rail concepts. It also happened with concept four, which is which are other light rail. We also looked at it for um, the options which were not light rail, which did not extend light rail, and it actually occurred with those as well, to a lesser degree. Uh, what we show here is that the, the passenger loads on East San Fernando Valley, again, go above the capacity of that line before people get to the orange line and are able to transfer into the Sepulveda system. So given this issue with capacity, um, we ended up coming back to the community in the second round of, of meetings with them and, and suggesting these uh, modifications to our study. The first one being that we would no longer look at light rail as part of our study due to insufficient capacity and, and an inability to actually modify that line in order to absorb this uh, demand that we were expecting. The second is that given this high demand associated with the other transit modes, we modified the monorail and heavy rail so that they could accommodate um, this increase in passenger loads on East San Fernando Valley, primarily by extending those options farther north so that they could, as we call it, intercept 
the demand, the passenger demand on the San Fernando Valley line. And then two other refinements we made is we ended up eliminating the Purple Line extension that went to the valley. It was the lowest performer. And then we also eliminated any connection that would happen to the Westwood VA station along the Purple Line that's under construction now. So with those refinements, we came back with an updated set of alternatives, which are shown here. We came from six to four. Uh, and I won't talk about them in detail, but basically just notice here that the options, um, which used to primarily stop around the orange line, now go further north and connect to the Low Sand Metrolink corridor at Van Nuys Boulevard. So they all extend north to, to that location. Okay. And after we did that, we wanted to know, did, did, did our revision actually address the issue we identified in East San Fernando Valley? And this graphic here shows that yes, as, you, as demand builds on that East San Fernando Valley line, it does not exceed the capacity line, shown there with the red dotted line and people are able to transfer from Metrolink Van Nuys um, into the Sepulveda system. So also as part of the second round of meetings when we introduced these refinements to the Valley Westside options, we also introduced new options or initial options for going to LAX, Westside LAX. Um, what we wanted to look at here was the ability to extend from the Expo line at either the Bundy station or the Sepulveda station down to LAX. We wanted to hit as many activity centers as we could along the way, and we wanted to stay within existing transportation corridors to the extent possible. So initially what we looked at were Sepulveda Boulevard uh, the, and the 405 freeway. Uh, Sepulveda, we would look at an underground alignment only. Um, the 405 freeway, we would look at uh, being adjacent to the 405 and possibly elevated for a, for a certain distance. Uh, and then uh, both of our options, actually all of our options that you'll see tonight, um, ended at the Crenshaw line of the future airport metro connector station. Okay. The other corridors we initially proposed were along Centinella. So a couple options for heavy rail extending from Expo. They're either Bundy or Sepulveda going south along Centinella. And then we also brought back the Purple Line. We thought we'd give it one more chance. So we, we looked at extending the Purple Line south this time instead of north, uh, following Centinella and connecting to airport metro connector at, at, at Crenshaw line. Uh, our primary east-west streets were along you know, Venice, Washington, Jefferson, Manchester, etc. Uh, on our way to the airport area. So throughout the study, we've uh, had the fortunate opportunity to work with a lot of different agencies. Uh, you know, many of these folks we would not typically meet with this early on in our development process, but uh, given the scale and complexity of the project, we felt it was important to reach out to them sooner rather than later. Um, Luckily, most people accepted our invitations to talk, and we've, we've begun a good, a good discussion, lines of communication with them that we hope to carry into the next phase of the project. But these are just some of those groups there that we've met with. We've done extensive outreach, obviously. Many of you probably heard about us. Um, uh, definitely in the news, plenty of times, but we've had really good feedback from the community, a lot of interest in the project. I think so many people are affected by the 405, about travel between the valley and the west side, that it's easy to really go out and find folks who, who want to tell you a little bit about their thoughts on the project. Based on some of those thoughts we received, we did, we did look at making certain changes to the project, which we, which we did and we brought back to the public as part of our third and final round of community meetings. Um, shown here are two of the changes that we brought back. One is to reintroduce a possible station at San Monaco Boulevard for all of the alternatives. Um, this station has some challenges. Uh, we have an earthquake uh, fault. The Santa Monica earthquake fault is in that area, uh, which we've been challenged with on the Purple Line, so we understand it. Um, so it's a challenge, but we're not saying that it creates, um, it makes the, the uh, station location uh, infeasible, but we'll, we'll include it now uh, during this feasibility study. Uh, the other option we looked at, which was a new alignment along Oberlin Boulevard. Uh, we compared it to Centinella and to Sepulveda. Uh, and it wasn't the worst performing option, but it wasn't the highest either, but it, it, it warranted further consideration, so we added that into the study as well. Another option that we um, got a lot of comments on was um, why didn't we look at um, locating the transit options uh, in the middle of the 405 freeway as, as long as we could? Um, and it is a very reasonable question, and one that we did consider early on in the study um, however, what we did is we came back and we listed a few of the reasons why we did not choose to explore it further as part of the feasibility study, and we show them here. One is that I mentioned earlier the express lanes is being planned for the 405 between the 
understand the 101. So it presents uh, a physical fit challenge in terms of finding a way to get all these projects into the median of the 405. Um, another challenge would be that north of, on the north part of the 405, um, north of the 101 approaching Sherman Way, we actually do not have a center median to work with, um, which would be a challenge, meaning that we either have to you know, change the lane configuration or widen possibly the 405 in that section. And then another consideration are that um, putting a series of columns down the middle of 405 could present a sightline issue for, for drivers who are trying to navigate some of the curves in this roadway. Um, so we would need to consider that in terms of meeting Caltrans' uh, design and safety standards. So that's, a, that's another challenge with a, a series of, of infrastructure in the middle of 405. So those are some considerations. That's why we did not propose an alternative in the middle of the 405. However, we did try to utilize um, the 405 adjacent area to, to kind of route our alternative that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but in terms of feasibility, again, we're looking at um, identifying as many challenges as we can to the options that we're looking at, pointing those out, making sure we document them, and creating a basis for why we're selecting certain alternatives to move forward and, and others are not being um, chosen. So here we are to the refined list of alternatives, and this is what we ended up with in the study, so I'll walk through these in a little bit more detail. But we still had four, three heavy rail alternatives and one monorail. Um, starting on the left there, we had a heavy rail alternative, which is uh, completely underground, starting in the north at the top of the map there at the Metrolink station uh, on Van Nuys Boulevard. We would have uh, the first station, then it would uh, travel underground under the East San Fernando Valley light rail line that's being planned on Van Nuys Boulevard to another station of the Orange Line with a transfer option. Then continuing north or south underneath Van Nuys with another station at Ventura Boulevard. Then it would uh, go underneath the Santa Monica Mountains uh, all the way to a UCLA campus station south of Sunset. Uh, a station at the Purple Line for a transfer to the Purple Line near Wilshire and Western or Westwood. And then from there, the, the alignment would either go to the Expo Bundy station or the Expo Sepulveda station uh, with an intermediate station at Santa Monica. And the options there on the, on the west side from UCLA south would be the same for all the alternatives, okay? HRT2 is slightly different. Um, it too is completely underground for the entire length. Um, after it leaves the Metrolink station though, it moves over to the Sepulveda corridor, underground to the Orange Line station at Sepulveda, uh, then under Sepulveda to Ventura, which is another station. And then south of Ventura Boulevard, it would go um, stay underground through the mountains uh, until it reached the UCLA campus station. Heavy rail uh, option three is, is slightly different in the valley because we're looking at possibly having that line be elevated in the valley itself. Uh, so from the Metrolink station, it would actually follow the Metrolink right away uh, northwest until it got to Sepulveda. Then it would curve south. Uh, it would include a new station at Sherman Way, then another station at the Orange Line, another station at, at Ventura Boulevard, and then south of Ventura Boulevard, it would transition into a tunnel and remain in a tunnel all the way through the west side. And then finally, the last option is a monorail option. This one uh, has the same aerial alignment through the valley as the HRT3. So again, aerial from the Metrolink station, aerial along Sepulveda, but then south of Ventura, it would actually transition and maintain aerial um, South Ventura. Uh, so it would move from the east to the west side of the 405, stay along the west side of the 405 all the way down until just north of Getty Center Drive. Then it would transfer back over to the east side of the 405 and then transition into a tunnel as it makes its way to the UCLA campus station. So these were the four alternatives that we concluded with at the end of the feasibility study. Um, another consideration that we had to take on as part of this project is a maintenance and storage facility that I mentioned earlier. Um, initially, we looked at the possibility of utilizing existing or planned storage facilities for the project. Once we ruled out the possibility of using another co-located co uh, or shared facility, we had to look for our own. Some of the requirements we followed are to be close to the alignments we were, we were developing, quarter mile is preferred. Um, we were looking at a very large site 20 to 30 acres possibly for this project. Um, and as you know, this is just to maintain the vehicles outside of their revenue service operation. 
So we identified three locations initially. Um, and these are what we presented in the final feasibility study. So starting on the far left here, we have an option in the west side. This is just east of the 405, west of Sepulveda, uh, north of Olympic. Um, this site could be served by all the alternatives um, that we're considering uh, at this point in the study. Uh, our second option is in the valley, uh, just north of the Metrolink station on Van Nuys Boulevard and just to the east of Van Nuys Boulevard. This option here in the middle would primarily work with HRT1 and HRT2. Uh, those are the two underground alignments that are coming into the final stop, uh, more in a north-south orientation. And then the third option there is near Woodman, just south of the Metrolink line. Uh, and that location would serve better the HRT3 and MRT1 options, which are aerial uh, and which are approaching the station uh, in a south -leaf, southeast orientation. So this is the criteria that we applied throughout the, the entire study. I'll walk through some of these uh, in terms of the results in just a moment. Um, for the Valley of the West Side, in terms of mobility, um, we did um, have very, very good ridership projected for this project, uh, as many of you may have heard, um, ranging between 122 to 137,000 daily boardings. Um, as a comparison, our red line and purple line today is around 138,000 boardings, so um, this would be one of the more um, uh, successful lines in the system in the future, based on these ridership numbers. Um, good amount of low-income riders we would introduce to the project, as well as new transit trips. So folks that are otherwise not taking transit today could be encouraged to use transit. Uh, and if you look at the transit times down there at the bottom, this is again from the Metrolink line in the middle of the valley down to Expo. Uh, it ranges between 16 minutes and 26 minutes for that trip. So again, very good travel times, uh, very competitive with private automobile through this corridor, and, and really uh, contributes to the high ridership that we're seeing in these projections. Another question we asked is, is how are people actually using the line or getting to the line, uh, accessing the project? So we looked at it and what we show here on the left are the different uh, modes of access to the project. And as you, might get, as you might guess, much of it's coming from other transit. You know, we are connecting to a number of high capacity transit lines throughout our study area, whether it be in the valley to BRT or to new light rail lines, or whether it be on the west side to our heavy rail purple line. So in, a large percentage of folks are coming from other transit lines. Um, another large percentage is walking and biking to our project. And a smaller percentage is coming by vehicle. So 4%, uh, 2% looking to park. Also with um, the UCLA campus station, what we, what we discovered, <clears throat> which was interesting, is that um, UCLA actually con contributes quite a bit to our overall ridership. Um, in fact, it would become the busiest non-transfer station in the metro system. Um, so it's very, very uh, promising in terms of the activity we would expect at that station and the ridership we would gain from it. In terms of environmental, um, again, we're taking a high level look at the potential environmental impacts at this phase of the study or at project development. Um, here, we're, we're looking at you know, the potential for uh, noise, visual, possible uh, wildlife habitat uh, impact, as well as property acquisition. Um, and what we're seeing here basically is that the more that we're underground, the less likely we are going to have uh, some of the impacts that I just talked about. Um, more aerial, we could have uh, more impacts. So it's just disclosing that, that relationship. Um, we also developed capital cost estimates as well as uh, OM cost estimates for the different options that we considered, and those are included in our final feasibility study. But um, here are the numbers for the Valley of West Side. And they range between 9.4 billion uh, to just under 14 billion for uh, the Valley of the West Side portion of the project. O&M costs range between 81 million and 137 billion. And the next few rows here that you see uh, kind of talk to some of the um, contributors to those numbers. Um, the length of the project uh, when we set out, you know, we may not have expected to be at 15 miles for one of the alternatives, but one of them is, is up to 15 miles and as low as 13 miles. Um, obviously, how much of the project is underground will contribute to its cost. It's more expensive to, to dig tunnels than it is to build it above ground. So those are some of the stats there for the different options. Now, in terms of the west side, uh, transitioning to that one and some of the refinements we made, uh, as I mentioned, we, 
We originally looked at the 405 corridor, Centinella, and Sepulveda corridors for the different options, uh, and then we added in Overland. So this, these maps here show all of the corridors that you could extend through um, from the Expo at Sepulveda Station. And again, I mentioned the, the cross streets that we would consider stations at, and all of the alignments within the Airport Metro Connector Station. Again, Cincinnati was another corridor we looked at, and it was promising uh, for options that go through Bundy. So again, we have a heavy rail that goes through Bundy, extending from the valley, and then we also had the idea of extending the Purple Line again uh, from the VA uh, Westwood Station south through the Bundy Expo Station to LAX. In terms of mobility for the west side LAX concepts, um, very good ridership again, as we were expecting. Um, now this ridership is taking into account the entire corridor, so from the valley all the way down to the to LAX. Um, but you see the numbers here, you know, um, just under 200,000 to uh, nearly 240,000 uh, for the HRT options, and Purple Line Extension has slightly more, um, although that's a somewhat of an artifact of, of double counting when we consider all the transfers that are happening from um, the valley portion into the Purple Line itself. But uh, still, very robust numbers. Um, as you can see here, the travel times are contributing significantly to those numbers. Uh, going from the Metrolink in the Valley all the way down to LAX in uh, roughly 30 minutes is uh, a pretty significant uh, uh, travel time. We also looked at environmental for the southern portion of the corridor. Um, similar characteristics, um, generally more above ground will have more impacts than above underground. Um, the west side is a little different because there's just more underground that we have to contend with, so it's a uh, it's it's slightly different um, results than we saw for the west side to the valley. Uh, here are the cost numbers, uh, ranging between uh, six billion to ten billion uh, for the options that extend from the expo down to LAX, uh, and OM costs there roughly in the, the forty to uh, 80, 80 million. So we are, um, with the conclusion of the feasibility study, we wrapped up early planning, as we call it, the, the first step of trying to narrow down the range of options that we could consider for the project and prepare ourselves for environmental review. Um, as I said, we have an RFP out right now to start that environmental review process. Um, so that is, that is moving forward. Um, one other thing I mentioned earlier is we are doing a pre-development agreement as well. Uh, that is also a procurement that's on the street. But I'll just talk briefly about what that is, um, keeping this to what we've already disclosed previously with, with our community groups. Um, but this is just kind of giving you the why we might be doing a PDA. Um, and a PDA is, 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 is definitely new for Metro, definitely new for um, really a lot of folks. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting in the sense that um, Sepulveda is very challenging, very complex, and we wanted to take an opportunity to look at all possible ways that we could actually deliver this project. So P3 is one that we've considered for some time, um, and what the PDA, PDA process does, it allows us to engage with the private sector uh, earlier in our development process to get their input, to get their thoughts and feedbacks, and, and innovation really in, in terms of thinking about how we might develop this project um, before we actually put it out for, for delivery. Um, so what the PDA teams will have the opportunity, opportunity to do is either take what we've developed through the feasibility study and modify those, expand on those, um, uh, optimize those, or they may actually come up with a completely new idea, right? Something that, that, that is different from what we considered in the uh, feasibility study but hopefully it still meets the mobility objectives that we set out with in, in, in our feasibility study, right? Connecting to many of these other transit lines that we have in development throughout the county, making sure that we're providing folks with good connectivity, good, good access to more transit throughout our region. Those are obviously still important to us. Um, the PDA teams um, would be able to develop these alternatives that they introduce in parallel with us as we move through the environmental process. So that is definitely unique to what has been done you know, previously in terms of private um, <coughs> private contractor or private, private entity involvement. So we hope that there is an opportunity to leverage innovation earlier, to incorporate that into our environmental review process, 
and to streamline, hopefully, um, the delivery later on. So some of the things that we're trying to balance as we move forward is hopefully bringing on this early contractor involvement. Um, we can look more, more closely at constructability and project risk. Um, we can look at ways to um, set up for commercial and financial feasibility on the P3, eventual P3 contract that would be put out. Uh, and then we also want to focus on possibly construction schedule acceleration. How might we get this project done sooner? Uh, as many of you have heard in the news, there's you know ambitions to get this done by the Olympics. Um, the 2028 is not that far away, so that's quite a challenge. Um, but if we're going to do it, we want to we want to work with the private sector to say, hey, how might this happen? Tell us your ideas, uh, and we'll consider them. So that's it um, for the presentation. That was our, our two-year study in a, in a 35-minute uh, overview. So uh, with that, I can open up to any questions. You might have. Yes. Your projected uh, uh, wider sources there mm -hmm. showed only two percent uh, uh, accessing the station by vehicle, um, and thirty-seven percent, uh, I believe, uh, bike and walking. Mm -hmm. uh, first, what? How far do you expect people to walk? Yeah, I mean, typically, yeah, biking obviously a little bit further, but walking you know, half a mile is just pushing the limits there. So. And then if you're, if you're assuming 2% are, are going to access the system uh, by a vehicle, what sort of impact do you think that will have on the 405 freeway? Well, so let me, so 2% is actually 4%. So we have 2% that we're expecting to be kiss and ride, so either being picked up or dropped off at a station, um, not needing to park there, and then another 2% would be parking rides so folks that would drive to our station and park there. Uh, part of this, as I mentioned, there's a, there's a large percentage of folks that are coming by other transit lines, so what folks may be doing is, is taking, uh, either being dropped off or accessing one of the other transit lines that connect into Sepulveda in order to reach our project. So, as I mentioned with East San Fernando Valley earlier, what we saw is a general rise in, in ridership on connecting lines because people are using those connecting lines to access Sepulveda. So that's why we, we have still a large percentage of folks coming in by rail and bus because they're able to, to get to Sepulveda by way of either existing or planned uh, lines. I had a question about the, the LAX portion of this too. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, the however you get there, uh, I guess it's all underground, uh, uh, aligned with aviation? Um, most of the options in the LAX area are underground that we're showing. And, yeah. and so you're coming in uh, uh, aviation <coughs> near, alignment? Yeah, near area? aviation and, and Century Boulevard in that area. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, if you turned that aviation along Century mm -hmm. um, into the airport, you only have to go about a, uh, half a mile and you'd be right in the middle of the airport. As right. opposed to heading out east, causing a transfer, I guess, on onto the so rather than going straight into the airport mm -hmm. by turning west uh, a half a mile or so, now it looks like you're adding about three miles to the trip, maybe more, and having to get out of the. Uh, whatever it is that's in the subway, whether right. it's a monorail or whatever, right. uh, get out of it, get on the people mover, mm -hmm. and then head back into LAX. That doesn't seem very efficient. Yeah, I mean, yeah, for the folks that are trying to get to the airport, you're, you're, you have a little bit of out of direction travel to, and a transfer to get in there. Um, I, you know, to say that we didn't consider going into the terminals would be a lie. Um, I, yeah, I've worked on previous projects where we looked at how, how to get into the airport, and there are a number of challenges with going into the airport, um, both whether it's underground or, or trying to do it above ground. I will say that there's less room above ground now that they're building the people movement. It's taking up a lot of space within the terminal area. Um, and given the amount of investment the airport's doing with the people mover, um, we felt that it made most sense and was most efficient from a system standpoint to make a connection to the airport metro connector 
to not just the people mover, but also to the Crenshaw line and to the Green Line and to a new bus terminal that's there serving served by 13 different bus lines. So it was, a, it was a nice hub to bring folks into so that they can make a choice where they need to transfer um, from where to get to. Now, that's not to say that there, there are not still refinements to come with this, with this southern section. Um, there could be opportunities to intercept with the people mover sooner uh, or at other locations. I mean, these are all things that we would have to consider and look through um, as we begin to develop this portion of the corridor more. of the new transit corridors mm -hmm. uh, one by one uh, to your planning study. Mm -hmm. So there will be more and more major transfer points between the different transit corridors. So do you have any plan uh, for the land use of those major uh, transfer points such as uh, Van Nuys <coughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, using the valley as an example, we're with the orange line there today, with the new light rail line coming in, with the Spolda line coming in, there's, there's definitely an increase in transit uh, intensity and density that, that is, you know, not common to the valley. And so I think your question is a good one about how, how might land uses change in the future, given this, you know, increase in, in, of, of transit. Uh, investment in the valley. I, I will say that the city of LA is, is doing neighborhood plan updates right now, and they're really focused on a few areas. One is around North Hollywood, which a new development is going in there, so they're doing some neighborhood plan updates for North Hollywood, and they're also looking at an update around the Van Nuys station on the Orange Line as, and the and the Sepulveda station. So as part of those updates and as part of our coordination with the city of LA, is we're talking with them about some of these proposals to, to, to bring in even more transit to what is there today, and for them to consider how, how might land uses that they that they oversee, how might they change given this this change in transit? Yes. Uh, I imagine you've come, you've received a lot of <coughs> comments. Um, I, I was just wondering if there's like a particular alignment, both the north and the south section, or anything that you know that's like, oh well, clearly this alignment got a little bit higher public uh, support, or if it's all kind of about the same. It, it's what's well, not about the same. I would say that um, <clears throat> I would, it, it's very different in, in terms of the feedback we got in the valley versus the feedback we got on the west side. So the valley was was was, was very concerned about any of our options that were elevated, that were above ground, and and whether it's going down to Pulvida or, or any other areas of elevated line, they're very concerned about the impacts of that, whether it be visual, whether it be impacts to traffic. Uh, Etc. So there was there was concerns there in the valley. So there was um, there was more vocal support, I would say, to um, support something that would be underground, a subway in in, in that portion of the corridor. Uh, now on the west side, we were we were more uh, most of our alternatives, as you saw, were all underground, uh, at least to the expo connection. So there wasn't that type of feedback we were getting from the public. It was more about you know debating whether or not Bundy made more sense than Zapolda. Um, concerns about the tunneling itself. What would that? What would, how would that impact you know the residents or the businesses along that area? Um, construction kind of talking about construction fatigue, right? Because we have the purple line which is under construction now. You know we completed the 405 widening not too long ago. This project's close close on the tail of the purple line. So so how do how do people really kind of absorb that much construction activity over a long period of time? So those are some of the comments we got. Um, in terms of concerns. Um, I will say that, that, that both the valley and the west side, there was, I'd say the most prominent comment we got was, we need this today, we needed this yesterday, just do it, right? So there, there's a lot of still support for the project, even though there are certain specific concerns about what, which alternatives we look at. Yep. Uh, Corey, can you talk a little bit about uh, introducing yet another technology like the monorail? into the mix of the light and heavy. Uh, yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought it up. So, so 
Yeah, I think we're at why. why. Why introduce another technology? And so I didn't explain that at the beginning, but um, you know, when we when we started this project, uh, although we had billions of dollars to measure around, uh, we knew it would be very expensive, right? Trying to get a project between the valley and the west side, uh, and we knew that tunneling, although it was assumed in prior studies, and, and kind of everyone assumed that would be a reasonable option, would be just to tunnel into the mountain, you know, out of sight, out of mind, fastest, most direct option. Uh, we knew it would be expensive, so we wanted to look at other technologies that would possibly allow us to not tunnel as much and to possibly go up and over the, the mountains. And so the monorail option that I, I talked through, um, the reason it came about is that it, it allowed us to consider um, going up and over the Santa Monica Mountains because it's a rubber tire technology, so it's able to handle uh, steeper grades than what our, our light rail and heavy rail can, can typically do. And, and particularly on the, the north side of the mountains where we had a longer extended uh, grade that we had to navigate. So um, the monorail, what, we looked at a number of different options that could handle that, that grade, and we felt that the monorail was, was uh, one of the more promising options in terms of technologies to, to navigate this part of the corridor. Um, it had similar capacity ability as, as any of the other modes we were looking at, whether it be light rail or even heavy rail. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's still evolving as a mode. It's not common in the, in the United States as much as other parts of the world, but it's still definitely evolving in other parts of the world, so there's still opportunity there. Uh, but the primary reason was to try to reduce cost to the project and introduce a, a transit mode or transit technology that could, that could go up and over the mountains as opposed to through. What's the max speed you guys <coughs> Right now, we, we assumed about a 50 mile per hour max speed. So overall, this this alternative, and that's that's a good point. I mean, one of the one of the challenges this alternative had, and one that we we saw in terms of its overall travel times, you, you notice it was longer travel times than the other option, was due to the lower the lower speed. Um, obviously, as technology changes, as things speed up, um, you can make advances in terms of reducing travel times and making it more competitive with other modes. But both the speeds, both the grade that's navigating, and, and more turns that it has versus a straight tunnel. Um, was affecting its overall travel time. So it's a, currently it's a new delivery method for our heavy launch rail. Um, we've we'll been working with other agencies to kind of build that knowledge and uh, kind of learn from like lessons learned from other agencies. I understand uh, the provision of rail is kind of to implement some of the see on the like US product and we work with DART and Zendek. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and you know, LA Metro is big, and we're you know we're doing a lot of great things here, but you know we're, we don't know it all. So I think whether it's CMGC or whether it's this this new you know PDA approach, we're we're definitely open to talking with other agencies or what they've done, um, even if it's not a direct one to one relationship, just just handling P threes in general. Uh, other agencies, you know. Maryland, for example, other agencies have dealt with uh, P3 delivery, and so where we can learn from them, we're definitely in communications to try to try to kind of understand lessons learned and figure out how we might do it better on, on our track. Consider wildfires, landslides, um, things like that in our in our study, and and so I think the recent fires did maybe make people more sensitive to it, um, and and we we will I mean we'll we'll consider that in the next phase, and yeah I think it's a it's a concern um, if you have something above ground that's in a wildfire area there there's a risk I guess, um, but um, we don't have any great examples yet of anywhere else in our system where wildfire has been so. Um, has been an issue. I mean, we're mostly in urban areas where it's less likely. This is the one case where we're trying to take it through a natural, more natural environment where the, the risk of wildfire increases. Yes? Um, has the fast moving changes in people's habits with uh, ride sharing and bike sharing and scooters, um, have you been able to keep up with that change and sort of anticipate the possibility that it continues even faster and changes? Uh, well, what? what, what might change? Mm -hmm. 
are we keeping up? That's, that's a good question. I don't know. It's, it, it, is a government agency keeping up with private innovation? And that's, that's <laughs> well, it, 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 it whether it affects where things are and, and, and the pros and cons of each. Yeah, yeah. no, I, it's, it's a good question. I think, I think the, the, the ride sharing, um, even the, the use of scooters and other uh, devices, shared devices, is, is <coughs> becoming an interesting challenge for us. You know, um, <coughs> the idea of more people um, not wanting to park, per se, but to be using these rights or services to get picked up and dropped off is going to put a new type of pressure on the way we design our stations, the areas that we make accessible to pick up drop off. So that's something that we'll have to consider more going forward. How do we accommodate that? Um, because we don't want to lose that ridership because our facilities are not designed to, to handle these changes in, in mobility, right? Um, we're already seeing challenges with the scooter generation in terms of using scooters to get to our stations, trying to take them onto our vehicles. What do we do? How do we regulate that? Do we, do we create designated areas for them to park um, those scooters so that other people getting off our train can find them easily, use them, et cetera? I think we've, we've started to tackle those issues. Um, I, I will say it's going to take some time to figure out what's the right mix of, of options to accommodate these new modes. Um, but I think it's always to our advantage to, to, to bend when, when these technology advancements happen because we hope that they're just improvements to our, our ridership on our, on our system, right? I mean, people are using these because they can more easily access our transit, so we want to accommodate that. Yes? So I want to say a couple, uh, couple of points. First off, uh, scooters will never do the same task as well as trains do. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, please do talk to about making portals for landing pads for scooters at the, at the subway portals. That would be a lot of help. Also, one thing that they do in China that we don't do in LA, which would really help with bicycles, is they put these little ramps on the side of the staircases. So if you've got a, a bicycle or a little suitcase, you can just roll up the ramp rather than having to have it go clunk, 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 clunk up and down <laughs> and either work with or fight gravity along the way. Um, and also that would reduce strain on the elevators. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna play uh, uh, devil's advocate here a little bit. Um, we've got two trains going into Van Nuys. Van Nuys is one of the last affordable neighborhoods in the valley, as is Panorama City and Bacoima, where the, these trains are gonna go to. And although I support densification of urban corridors and along uh, transit corridors, I'm concerned that with like pieces of legislation like SB50, that we're gonna, just going to gentrify the living hell out of the mid valley where the working class lives and, and you know works. Uh, and so, what is Metro doing to to mitigate that to to, to keep the the transit riders along the transit corridors? Oh, that's a big question. Um, yeah, I think the, the challenge of, of, of gentrification around transit, the challenge of um, affecting land use by, by implementing our projects, those, those are not going to go away anytime soon. Um, just the general affordability of Los Angeles anywhere is, is obviously a challenge right now. We're, we're all confronted by the homelessness crisis that's going on in the city and in the country. Um, we don't have any quick answers to any of these. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to do our part you know, in partnership with other agencies, with, you know, other cities to try to find ways to, um, you know, reduce displacement from areas where transit's introduced, um, to, to find ways to introduce more affordable housing in projects that we do uh, at Metro, uh, or to support in any way we can legislation uh, through, through the state or other areas that, that might help us in terms of, um, uh, keeping communities intact that we're going into and making sure that, that, that the low-income rider can still benefit and can still easily access our, our service. Um, I'll say that SB50 is, was not something that came up on this polar project, but it has come up on other projects. So I think you know, our, our part in all this is to understand how this legislation may negatively affect, unfortunately, the, 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 the work we're trying to do with, with transportation um, and to, to be a voice as much as we can in, in trying to um, guide that legislation in a way that, that can, can benefit as many people as possible. So, <coughs> if I understand correctly, your PDA process will be going concurrently with the environmental. Right. So, the new concepts that the PDA um, 
program will come up with, will they be automatically integrated with the environmental to be clear? Yeah, any concept in the, in the PDA process would be part of the environmental review process that we're doing in parallel. So you don't expect the PDA process to do uh, an environmental separately? No, no, the, the environmental process has to be led by Metro. Um, so we have to do that. Um, and uh, the expectation is that we don't, we're, we're already, you know, trying to move this along as quickly as possible. So the idea of parallel activity and trying to clear everything as part of one environmental document is where we think it's, it's most streamlined. environmental document we prepare would still be circulated for public comment. When do you think that would be, or, or I mean, I don't know, maybe you can't speak to that. But. Well, I mean, we've, we've, we've generally thrown out dates, but I mean, it's, it's you know, we're in the procurement process now. We're, we're hoping to, um, to, to conclude that procurement process this summer, and then we'd be able to start the environmental process uh, later this fall. And, um, you know, the, given the scale of the project, we'd, we'd probably be looking at a couple of years to, to complete a, a draft document that would be ready for public circulation. Okay. Yep, Joel. Could, could you speak just a little bit uh, about the, the MRT operating characteristics? The, the ridership was fairly similar to the heavy rail, so are you running higher frequency and higher capacity trains? How did the monorail train sets and operations compared to heavy rail as a um, technology? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the headways were not different. We were assuming the same headways. Um, I mean, you know, one of the, the features of monorail is that it, it's, you know, often could be automated, fully automated. So you have the capability in, in, to, to operate more frequently in terms of the headways. Um, that could also be true for our heavy rail lines and our lighter rail lines as well these days. But um, monorail is a little bit uh, more, more accustomed to that. But the, the, the actual cars, uh, as we understand it, are a little bit smaller than what you might see on a heavy rail train. Um, so there may be a few more cars in a train than what a heavy rail might have. Um, but it would have the equivalent capacity uh, as a heavy rail um, train. And internally we operate six car heavy rail trains today in the metro system, and that's what we assumed in all of our alternatives here. Okay, if nothing else, thank you very much. <laughs>